arithmetic operation in any way? Or is this kind of a fresh out of Boulder? Hmm. Real link in, do the math, kind of reminds me of that. Cause usually yeah, some people call it the most important video you'll ever watch. I'm wow. showing it in my math class. Huh. Sorry, wow. I missed it. But What's the name of it again? Uh, arithmetic population and energy. Do you remember who that? Okay, good morning, and welcome to Cab Notes for May 2013. Um, the inspiration for this particular program was somewhat uh, heightened by the um, trailer for the Do the Math uh, video that was made by 350.org and Bill McKibben. Um, if we have that available, can we show that now? In the meantime, we're welcoming Jesse Herbert and Bruce Lehrman and Scott Prince to this panel this morning. I'm very, very grateful for their appearance here today. that we are going to hold them liable. We have a moral catastrophe on our hands. What's at stake now is civilization itself. This is the only question that will matter in the long run. Okay, very good. I've seen this video. It's very inspiring. And you can well imagine. And um, although we're not going to be as exciting as the crowds you just saw in there this morning, we have uh, our own personal local responsibility, I feel, to try to address this problem on the ways that we can as individuals here in Bennington and the uh, surrounding area. So uh, why don't we just go around the table and, you know, each of us can give our own personal feeling about where we're at on this whole global warming thing and what we can do locally. Um, and then we'll get into more details. Scott, how, where are you staying this whole issue? <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of hard to get your head around the whole thing, but the 395 that was mentioned in there, I should say that that's, that's old data. I think we're up just shy of 400 at the moment. It, it goes up and down a little bit as the seasons happen. Uh -huh. so. It's going down a tiny bit right now, um, but it's probably like 398 to 400 in that range. Uh -huh. Going up, uh, Bruce, you know, about two parts per million a year or, some, or something on there? Already. Yes, I think that's about right. Although, as you mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking, I think it has leveled a bit now. Nobody knows what the uh, reasons for that other are other than the seasonal changes, mm, but right. a couple of parts per million per year is... That's trajectory. It's pretty typical sort of thing. Actually, uh, I think 2011 was a, a record year for it, which is interesting because if you know the Kyoto Protocol from years ago and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and here the, the the amount of carbon that's going into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide has uh, accelerated a little bit in recent years, 
since the mm -hmm. uh, eco economic downturn in 2008, it's actually picked up again. Uh -huh. And uh, the parts per million is actually accelerating a little bit overall the last few years compared to, say, a decade or 20 years ago. Uh -huh. So it's interesting to me that, you know, there's the awareness worldwide is more than it's ever been on the issue, mm -hmm. and yet the, the rates are, are going in the wrong direction. So, you know, there's some sort of a mismatch there, I think. Uh -huh. Um, the ability to address this appropriately. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, Bruce, what's your kind of gut reaction to this whole problem? <laughs> well, my I guess right now my feeling about it is that we're in a position now where we have to deal with the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. That uh, the time when we might have hoped hoped to actually prevent or change course in dramatic ways to lessen the effects of global warming, frankly, I think are, are pretty much past. Mm -hmm. And that right now, we will see changes. We are seeing changes in our environment. People yeah. say that you can't link specific events to the level of carbon, di or carbon monoxide, dioxide in the atmosphere. But at the same time, one of the known effects of this is going to be a more turbulent environment, which we have certainly experienced in the last few years. Mm -hmm from our own experiences here in Vermont to New York and all of the East Coast of the United States. My particular interest in, in as I say, dealing with the facts on the ground is with our use of transportation. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly interested in that aspect because I think particularly for us here in Vermont, but also worldwide, that's the area that's most amenable to some change. Uh -huh. It's, it's, it's frankly currently one of the most wasteful aspects of our modern society and consequently it's a way in which we might have more impact on or reduce it, our impact on the environment than any other way that I know of. Mm -hmm. Besides, I've always been a motorhead, so yeah. this is a chance <laughs> to try to turn that around and do something worthwhile. Yeah, or go along your chosen course, yeah, very good. Jesse, where do you fall in on this whole deal? Well, um, I guess when I was younger, I was really concerned about these issues. Um, mm -hmm. I lived in Washington, D.C. for a while. I worked on some uh, fuel cell technology, worked on that later after I got my degree. Uh, a company outside Albany, um, I kind of can't, became a little disillusioned with the abilities of some advanced high technologies to really uh, do what I felt we needed to do in a timely mm -hmm. way. You know, there's still a little bit too much uh, space based technologies that aren't really down to earth yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I guess I have, you know, I taught high school for seven years and then uh, after that I just part-time teach at um, SBC, CCB, um, I'll have a course on sustainability starting at CCB in the fall. Um, I've taught a course for a number of years, topics in the environment at SBC, and mm -hmm. I, really, I really enjoy talking with my students about these issues that I feel really strongly about. Mm -hmm. um, I've found over the years that uh, I, don't, I don't like to really necessarily focus on the, the areas that are maybe still debated, like is this our fault, is this not? Um, some, one of the things I tell my students is in the past the climate was all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know we've had a really great stretch of um, access to energy, uh, liquid fuels, um, gr great stable climatic conditions, all those things um, were wonderful. But you know, when I was young, there were times when I just thought food materialized on the table. I didn't realize how much hard work my mom or you know uh, other parents were doing. And uh, as I've gotten older, I thought, boy, there's a lot of work that goes into producing food, getting ourselves around, having shelter. But I've always been fascinated in. Um, could you do those things in ways that didn't necessarily cost so much or take so much energy to do? Um, and you know, and, and, and I think some cultures have existed for long periods of time where they were doing that. You know, I'd love mm -hmm. to see us eventually end up kind of in more of a steady state type of a situation, but uh, you know, I mm -hmm. hope it doesn't uh, require such a rough transition as you know, some people are concerned about. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's the... Uh, think globally part of our awareness, you know, that this is a uh, certainly a global problem. And now uh, we want to talk a little bit about what we as people are doing locally to try to, you know, not necessarily solve the problem, but at least address it. So Scott, I know one thing you do is uh, produce a lot of your own food, right? 
Yeah, I think uh, probably everyone at the table here has a, a decent sized garden going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, my focus uh, for growing the garden wasn't necessarily related to climate change. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, a, a pleasant side effect, I suppose. It was more of the, the energy side of uh, things and also just mm -hmm. having high quality f foods. Uh, we have several children and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be nice to get them familiar with perhaps a more sustainable way of gathering their food. So um, gardening is mm -hmm. a big thing. Uh, transportation's challenging for me. I work fairly distant from where I live. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife could walk downtown to her work if she had the ability to. We have transportation needs, but at least it's close by. Mm -hmm. um, Home heating is another side, you know, the thermal issue of, uh, yeah. of space mm -hmm. heating and water. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, switched several years ago, again, mostly out of an energy concern from uh, using primarily fuel oil to using uh, locally harvested wood mm -hmm. uh, for most of our thermal heating now. So electricity mm -hmm. is still out there, but, uh, you know, that's one of those things like Jesse mentioned, you know, we've had this blessed time for several decades of all sorts of conveniences and luxuries and stuff like that and I kind of chalked electricity somewhat into that category uh -huh. so I can enjoy it while it works well for us all but so mm -hmm. um, gardening is probably the biggest thing to point to you know yeah mm -hmm. yeah we all know about this <laughs> thing of the average bite of food comes 1200 miles before it gets to our mouth <laughs> yeah it's uh interesting you know 100 years ago the all the uh the food that we grew the bulk of the energy that went into it was solar and then there would be some muscular exertion from uh, mm -hmm. animals or humans to bring it to harvest and to process it and to, to mm -hmm. finally before we could consume the food and mm -hmm. now uh, fossil fuels, natural gas, and you know, diesel or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, there's ten times as much energy that goes into it, aside from the solar end of things, wow. as what it supplies us. Uh, <laughs> you know, that that's a, a huge problem mm -hmm. for lots of reasons. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the, if you're concerned about the climate, or concerned about mm -hmm. sustainability, or or you know, the farming in your community, um, energy. You know, you name it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Bruce, I know one of your, well, as you mentioned, your favorite topics is the transportation thing. And we see you riding around on your bicycle all the time, which is just inspiring. Yes. Uh, so you're in, presently involved in this uh, trail from Bennington to North Bennington. Uh, yes, I am. And, uh, you know, the reasons for that trail really don't have a lot to do with improving our transportation situation. It's basically mm -hmm. a, a natural trail. What it may improve is the health of the citizenry. Mm -hmm. And it may also give people a better appreciation for how rich the natural environment around Bennington and within Bennington is. Mm -hmm. Because the trail goes along a section of the river that very few people have seen, and yet it's right. beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have the, the map, I can put that up and we can talk a little bit about what's been done so far and where the trail is going in the future. Uh, if at the bottom of the map, at the very bottom of the map is the junction and, and the, the bubble off to the lower right is the junction of Northside Drive and Hicks Avenue. So there is a section of the trail right now that goes through from Hicks Avenue to the Monument Plaza Shopping Center. And the reason that's important is because it means a bicyclist can come from the pedestrian bridge across the Walloon Sack up Hicks Avenue and go into Monument Plaza without ever having to go on Northside Drive. Furthermore, they can come out the back of Monument Plaza on uh, Harwood Road and bypass the 7A junction and at least be on 67A North uh, to go on toward uh, the shopping areas there or to North Bennington. But following the trail, if you come out the back of Monument Plaza, uh, at the end of Harwood Road, uh, it ends at, the old, at an old uh, river crossing across the Loom Sack, which is no longer there. But then it follows the river 
all along uh, the riverbank, or is intended to. This trail's, you know, a little sketchy right now, mm -hmm. but the section from the back of Monument Plaza to the end of Hardwood Road has now been blazed. And mm. the section from Harwood Road around to Morris Avenue has also now been blazed. It still needs to be uh, coated with gravel, but it's all been cleared. We've had some excellent community support in building it. It's been built in a few weekends with a lot of, uh, a lot of donated labor and a lot of donated time and a couple of donated uh, backhoes and front loaders. So it will then go around the back of the Morris Industrial Park, and then you see a straight line there that goes across 279. That line actually goes under the bridge where 279 goes over the Wollumsack River. Hmm. And as I say, in this area, this is a beautiful section of the river that very few people have ever seen. Yeah. So it's more, it, it really is more a nature trail than a transportation trail. And then ultimately it'll come up behind uh, Hannaford Plaza, go along the back of there on 67A for a short distance to the entrance to Bennington College. We've had discussions with Bennington College and we're discussing how we might effectively use their road system to then go on to North Bennington. And that would be where it, where it would end. You could go to Lake Perrin from there or you could go into uh, the village of North Bennington. Mm -hmm. So as I say, the, the real value of a trail like this is that it gets people out in more active pursuits. It mm. is a way that you'll be able to go from North Bennington to uh, downtown Bennington with only short segments on any road. Mm -hmm. And it provides you with some familiarity with areas of the community that people haven't seen before. And mm -hmm. it, it's of great historical significance. The old Stagecoach Road, as I say, used to cross the river there and go up to the monument. Oh, yeah. That used to be 7A uh, when it, in an earlier time. And again, all of those things are part of our heritage, heritage that we haven't uh, seen before or haven't had access to before. Mm -hmm. Does this help with the problems of, uh, of climate change? I think in some ways it does because it mm -hmm. gives you more appreciation for the natural environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does provide an alternate pathway that's friendlier to non-motorized traffic. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, we haven't solved or really addressed the problem of how to have mu multimodal traffic uh -huh. successfully, where uh -huh. bicycles and pedestrians and automobiles can operate in, in harmony together on the roadways. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people working on this problem, but mm -hmm. it's a very difficult problem because of all, because for three generations, we have been serving the automobile. Mm -hmm. And the infrastructure that serves the automobile doesn't necessarily serve other users very mm -hmm. well. And of course, mm -hmm. much of our transportation resources have gone to making things more convenient for the automobile, mm -hmm. not for making more things more convenient for other modes of transportation. So mm -hmm. now we're in a, in a sense uh, behind in the in the uh, in the process of trying to bring those two those several modes of transportation together. As uh, Jesse mentioned, I teach a course in alternate transportation occasionally at CCV. Uh -huh. One of the things I do is put up pictures of downtown Bennington from a hundred years ago. Oh, oh, there's yeah. mixed mode traffic all over the place. There's bicycles, there's pedestrians, there's trolleys, there's horse-drawn vehicles, there's automobiles, all sharing the roadway. And all, besides that, they're doing business along the, along the side of the road because mm -hmm. that's where business was done in many cases, wagons, carts, things like that. Mm -hmm. All of them were operating together in a much more effective way than we do today. Ah, yes. So it's interesting to look at those examples. When Jesse talks, talks about a uh, sustainable or a, a, con, a community that continue on, can continue on its own basis, to me that's an example of some of the things that we will have to review and look at to see how they might be, how we might benefit from what we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can carry on with that thought. <laughs> sure. Um, I often look with awe at what people used to do with such little uh, resources compared to what we have now. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I also find myself thinking, boy, we're so lucky now. Uh, for example, I live off-grid and mm -hmm. I've um, you know, had solar-powered uh, 
homestead for a while. And, uh, and, and I constantly am thinking, boy, electricity is nice, and I love, u- I love using the laptop and the internet, but um, do I really need to run my refrigerator you know, with electricity in the wintertime when there's not much sun, when there's free coldness outside? So I put oh. bottles of water outside and I freeze them. And lately I thought, boy, you know, what's stopping me from doing that right through the summer? Couldn't I just have gallon jugs and freeze them? And, you know, a lot of people, my friends and family might think, well, that's a little bit... Uh, you know, it's kind of a lot of extra work, but if you look in the past 100 or so years ago, they might say, man, he doesn't have to go with a saw and cut out chunks of ice out of the river. You know, he gets to just put water in a plastic container. What's that? You know, so I'm going to try that, have an insulated ice box that, you know, won't ever have any melting. And it's just ways that I can actually get away from needing so much solar electricity, kind of save it for the, maybe the high tech nice things or some lights at night, whatnot. But mm-hmm. Um, and for my freezer, for, you know, I've been learning about hunting and, and, and animal husbandry and uh, my neighbor mm-hmm. and I, you know, milk some of his goats and, and I've learned how to butcher. My grandfather was a butcher and it's something that I certainly wasn't raised to understand, but I've learned mm-hmm. about it and I've uh-huh. learned about the benefits um, to soil growing and, and you know, uh, some of the amazing ways that, that you can really have a, a healthy diet and a healthy impact on the ecosystem through intensive rotational grazing, for example. Hmm. But um, I'd love to make pemmican and jerky and not have to just freeze all my oh, meat. Yeah. You know, and that's what they used to do to preserve before freezers. They would smoke it or make pemmican or jerky. Uh-huh. But I do think that um, you know, my students have helped me to see. One thing I wanted to say is just you know, really I learned a lot from my students over the years. And one mm-hmm. of the things they really helped me to see was how does uh, this community, for example, view some of these issues. And for example, there's, there's a lot of feeling that organic food, for example, is too expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times I would talk to my students, that's why people used to produce food themselves in general, because it was expensive, you know, whether it was organic or not. You know, yeah. if you produce it yourself, it can A, be organic and no pesticides and whatnot, but it, you know, it's kind of a win-win. And, and regardless of what's gonna hit and when it's gonna hit, and because a lot of people I think, I've found that I would talk to them about, let's say, limits on liquid fuel production and a lot of parents would maybe they would tell me what their parents would think about that and sometimes they were like you know that's just a conspiracy by oil companies to raise the price and I I can't say that it's that it's really not my the evidence I've seen would make me think otherwise but a lot of times I would say to my students hey if even if that's the case if you find ways to be less dependent on expensive things like you know energy bills and food bills it's a win-win no matter what happens you benefit, and that's mm-hmm. you know. So I like to share things like that, and I talk to them about permaculture. Um, there's a place in Massachusetts where they're uh, selling perennial vegetables. I think there's a website called uh, I don't know if it's um, perennialvegetables.com. Eric Tone is a guy, and you know they're planting all this stuff that kind of regrows itself like asparagus. So it doesn't even oh. have to really be a ton of work necessarily oh, once yeah. you do some of the upfront work doesn't mean you're going to be slaving away the rest of your life because you want to save money on, on your food bills. Uh, but, you know, I still have a ton to learn myself, and I feel like a lot of my students have brought interesting um, ways that, th- that they've addressed things that I think about. Um, you know, might not be the exact same way as me. Not everybody's going to ride a motorized mountain bike in the wintertime with studded <laughs> snow tires like I've done. But, uh, you know, maybe they carpool or something, or maybe they figure out how to telemark. Uh, you know, not telemarket, but uh, maybe, that, but but telework. People, you know, are starting okay. more and more to commute. Even mm-hmm. some of my students, I had an online class. They were they were participating uh, from Albany and other places. They didn't even have to come to the class. Wow. So I think there's a lot of opportunities out there, and I try to focus with my students also on entrepreneurial opportunities. Are there ways mm-hmm. if our uh, society is going to go through some transformations, and societies generally always do, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, can you find ways to sort of uh, value add and, and maybe make a side living or do something as a hobby that's, that you can trade with friends or gift to family? And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and I think that's kind of exciting too because I always like the idea of having plans A, B, and C, you know? Yeah. And every one of those, and that's an assignment I give them actually, okay, if the economy does great and it skyrockets, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily think that's coming, but if it happened, you know, how, wh- what track are you on that, that things will work out well? Mm-hmm. If it, you know, keeps stumbling and we don't have the same type of economic growth we've been used to, well, maybe there's some other growth, like growth of food or growth in skills that are old-timer skills that they could still do and 
you know, help themselves out, just like people in Cuba after Russia collapsed. Um, you know, there was a big change in their economy. A lot more people went into food production once again. But, you know, some people say their health improved and they read, they were, you know, more physically fit, eating better quality foods. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's some silver lining maybe there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking about uh, when Bruce was talking about transportation mm -hmm. and you know, the mixed use. Uh, a great example is at the corner there of North Side Drive and where uh, Super 7 starts up going to the north towards Manchester. Mm -hmm. I know that's something that uh, a lot of folks are looking at trying to figure out how people can safely get from one side of the road to the yeah, other. Yeah. Uh, and just such a simple thing as crossing the road there is, is really challenging for mm -hmm. pedestrians and bicycles and anyone that's not wrapped in uh, uh, an <laughs> automobile of some sort. Yeah. The other thing that got me thinking about was um, you know the old pictures of downtown Bennington. Uh, another thing that happened at that time that isn't as pervasive now is we lived really close to where we worked. You know, mm -hmm. mixed-use zoning was, you know, oh. I mean, that was that's how things were. Mm -hmm. You might live upstairs from your, your business, which was downstairs, which is yeah. right off the street where all of this stuff is happening. And now, you know, we sort of have segregated these things out over yeah. the generations because it, it's something that's been easy for us to do. Um, you know, that's something uh, we need to think yeah. at when we're looking at uh, local planning and zoning mm -hmm. and stuff. You know, isolating shopping into an area on Northside Drive without any residential uh, access in, in that immediate area. Mm -hmm. You know, you're kind of enforcing, it, it's not reasonable to have people walk in and bicycle distances to these things. I mean, we only spend as, uh, so much time a day yeah. in our transportation needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as you isolate that, you know, you, automobile is, uh, is really becomes the only viable option for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so many levels to look at. I mean, we've talked about food and transportation and how to, you know, prepare our foods, uh, you know, whatever it might be. But, you know, yeah. things such as zoning is another factor. Mm -hmm. should also mention, um, for those that are looking to reduce their transportation uh, load a little bit. Uh, this next week, uh, there's a, a campaign called Way to Go Vermont. And if you go to waytogovt.org, uh, they will have some stuff on there on how you can reduce your, uh, your energy consumption. They really focus on next week, the, what is it, uh, the 15th or the 13th through the 17th. 17th. Yeah. But oh. uh, the, the website's there the whole time, so you can see there's, uh, you know, uh, car sharing, uh, carpools, uh -huh. ride sharing, uh, bicycling and stuff like that. It's, unfortunately, our area is not uh, real strong in, in the state. It's really, uh, I think, much more developed program for Chittenden County and maybe mm -hmm. Montpelier and even down into Rutland a, a bit and probably Brattleboro, I don't recall on their website that, but here in the southwestern corner of the state, there is really no uh, pinpoint uh, presence of, of support, but they have state level uh, options that are available through that website. Mm -hmm. If I could follow on to that yeah. for a minute. I, I'd like to suggest something to people that uh, was on the Vermont Bike Pedestrian Coalition website this week related to Way to Go Vermont, which is what they call the Way to Go Hat Trick. Sometime during that week, try to uh, carpool at least once, ride public transportation at least once, mm -hmm. and hard. at least bicycle or walk at least once to replace a trip that you would do in the car, Ooh. whether it's going for groceries or whether it's going to work or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you do all three of those in the week, or even if you don't, go back to either the Way to Go website or the Bike Ped website or the White, uh, Bike Ped Facebook page and tell us about what happened, how, how uh -huh. it worked for you. Huh. Uh, as, as Scott was uh, remarking, it's it may not be easy here in Bennington. We do have a public transportation system <coughs> that uh, that I use particularly in the winter. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you're a bicyclist, they have bike racks on all of the uh, buses. Is so right? you can take your bike downtown on the bus, ride around, take the bus back, maybe only do a mile on your bike for a 10 mile trip. And uh, mm. that's one way you might work that into the mix. But this is, this is a, 
this is the kind of thing that's a means to address some of these questions locally. Mm -hmm. You have to actually get out in your local environment yeah. and try these things before they have any meaning to you. Uh, uh, yeah. as, as you remarked, you know, people see me riding around on my, on my bicycle and they say, you know, well, that's easy for him. <laughs> well, the first morning that I did it, it wasn't easy for uh, me. Uh -huh. And the first week that I did it, did it, it wasn't <laughs> easy for me. And I learned where all the hills in town are very quickly. <laughs> but the mm -hmm. only way that you make an impact that's meaningful in your own life is to go out and try it. That's why I think the Way to Go Vermont program is mm -hmm. so great, mm -hmm. is because here's something that really challenges you. What's your response going to be to this to the transportation issues we face? What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Th there is no success or failure. There's only yeah. experience to be gained from it. So I hope people will kind of engage with this process and, and see what it's like. Yeah. This is, I'm thinking here, you know, what are the challenges here? And, you know, you, you are uh, an acknowledged <laughs> motorhead, you know, <laughs> transportation is your thing. So, and I know, you know, from conversations over the years, things with bikes and stuff, and Jesse too, um, you know, there's the challenges that, you know, we at this table really enjoy. For me, you know, gardening is something I like. Mm -hmm. I, I like biking. I don't have the opportunities like I used to because yeah. of my personal life. Uh, but um, it's, I think, particularly challenging for people watching this to say, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to do because if they're not a motorhead or they're not into gardening and stuff like that, it's like, well, what's, what's going to nip at them to, to do some of these things? And unfortunately, I think it comes down to for pretty much everybody, it's, you know, convenience versus the cost that goes mm -hmm. into that and cost for us these days is, you know, the, the monetary cost associated with things. So when it comes mm -hmm. to addressing things like global warming, you know, there's a lot of people that it's really important to them. And, you know, they, this is their life. I mean, in that <laughs> video that we yeah. saw, I mean, there's a lot of really committed people. But mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest that there are a lot more people that, you know, they have things on a daily level that are much more important to them, you know, how they're going to take care of the kids and get them to school or, you know, just, you know, mm -hmm. monetary issues with the way the economy has been. I mean, that they have things that they're short term, but much more focused on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to just kind of keep throwing things out there that are options for people as things become yeah. too challenging for them. You know, the, the price of food, Jesse mentioned earlier, is, is you know, it's a win-win if you can if it becomes more convenient for you and cheaper for you to just produce your own stuff, the other mm -hmm. problem, though, of course, is a lot of people don't even have space for such mm -hmm. things. And that's part of the zoning, you know, the, the how mm -hmm. we've lived our lives. We've been able to get into situations that maybe aren't particularly sustainable. So it's, you know, this is not easy stuff, uh, <laughs> you know, that you're trying to address here. I mean, we yeah. all know that. We've and it takes it a long time ago if it were easy. Yeah, yeah. and it can take a, a very long time uh, to have enough other pressures, I think, on, on society and our community to kind of reorient how we, mm -hmm. you know, where our focus is. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we keep kind of throwing things out there for people, options, you know, when yeah. they're ready, if they're at the point where they mm -hmm. need to make a change mm -hmm. and they know something is available, that's, that's going to be important, I think, going forward. Yeah, just on that issue of people not having room for <coughs> gardening. You know, there's this whole enterprise on garden on a wall where you have these hanging devices that you plant stuff in. I <coughs> know that looking through some of the websites, you know, because I'm on the uh, Ag Line Committee at the middle school, you know, some urban schools, you know, they have these walls and they have all these baskets hanging on them with all kinds of vegetables growing in them. A few, so, a few of my students did a presentation <laughs> just this semester about that, about oh, those yeah. hanging vertical gardens. Wow. At the same time, I, and I think it's fascinating and it's a really interesting development, I want to echo what Scott was saying because a lot of my students, right away, they're objecting when I talk about some of these things. They're like, that's great for you. What, what can I do? I, I rent. My time is totally booked. You know what? So sometimes I'll, I'll talk about things that, for example, if you build in a few extra minutes to get where you're going, if you drive 55 versus 70, you might be saving as much as 20% on your fuel bill uh -huh. because of aerodynamics and, mm -hmm. and, uh, 
engine resistance and things like that. So that's one thing. Um, also, in terms of winter heating costs, I've, I've talked to students before about uh, s some people's solutions where they'll do zone heating in their house or they'll oh, yeah. um, maybe they'll turn the heat down and there's actually uh, infrared units that you can buy that aren't even that much that shine heat on you so you can be comfortable. Of course, there's always just layering. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was growing up, I remember seeing people who lived on the street. Um, when I went to school at Syracuse when I was younger, there were people who lived on the street wow. and they just wore a lot of layers. So there's, <laughs> there's different ways that we can all, you know, in my own house in the winter, sometimes 50 something in the morning. So I'm not just saying to do these things and not <laughs> doing it myself. I hate with wood. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and yet I'm able, even my young son, who's four years old, is, you know, bundle him up, put a down uh, jacket on him and He's having a ball. He's fine with it. You know, maybe my wife isn't fine with it, <laughs> but as long as she's not home, you know, we're good to go for the day. But I, I think there's a, there are solutions out there. Um, even if, if you can't grow and, and you don't have a green thumb and you don't uh, have time to develop that skill, mm -hmm. one of the things we used to do was the local CSAs. We would go to Mighty Food Farm. I know there's a mm -hmm. neat CSA in Williamstown, not far, Cricket Creek Farm or something. Um, CSAs can, can provide lower cost food, we were paying about the same for the organic produce from the local CSA at uh, Mighty Food Farm as we were for regular vegetables in the grocery store because of markups. And, um, and then people, I know, I've known people who also worked or volunteered at the CSA and, and got food in exchange. That was another way to oh, yeah. you know, not have to do it all themselves, but still there are <coughs> options out there. And a lot of times if you just start looking, you can Google tips, there's tons of stuff on YouTube. You know, interesting ways. YouTube's kind of an interesting distiller of technology because you might look at how somebody does something, but if you look at how many views there are, generally the uh -huh. more views, you know, the more kind of interesting that adaptation or trick might be. And there's a lot of people sharing, hey, this is how I'm saving money or doing this or, you know, and, and necessity is the mother of invention. So over time, I think those things will continue to percolate and, and emerge. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of my favorite examples is growing sprouts. Oh, yes. If you've got a mason jar and a piece of screen wire and the rim from a mason jar ball mm. seal, you put some mung bean seeds in there, mm. you screw the lid on with the screen wire, you run water in it, you dump it out, you put it under your sink, mm -hmm. you do that for a week, and you've got sprouts mm -hmm. in the dead of winter. Yeah. They're, they're ten times as nutritious as the seeds themselves were. It's cost you uh -huh. nothing other than washing them off every day in terms of effort. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to over, oversimplify it. I, I, mm. In some people's lives, that would be a large mm. change in their schedule or their life, even See. those little things. Mm -hmm. But as Jesse says, sometimes maybe you can trade off one thing for another. I used mm. to get up in the morning when I was working, 4.30 in the morning, so that I could exercise for an hour. Mm. Sometime, mm. In the course of my working life, it dawned on me, it's about an hour ride to work on my bicycle. Huh. Why am I going, you know, why am I getting up to exercise at that hour in the morning when actually I could spend less time in the morning mm -hmm. if I just used that opportunity to exercise? And fortunately, I had a situation where I could shower at work once I got there. Mm -hmm. So for three quarters of the year, I made that substitution. And I would suggest mm -hmm. to anyone if you're going to a gym to work out, you might think about how your life could be rearranged so you wouldn't have to do that and you'd actually save time and gain mm -hmm. health by doing it. It's, you know, but sometimes we just don't think of these things or see the pattern in our yeah, lives yeah. and how they become dependent on certain kinds of energy input or certain kinds of customs mm -hmm. that we're used to. The, the whole <coughs> thing with obesity these days, you know, everyone's concerned about sugar or chocolate milk or whatever the thing might be, um, you know, high fructose corn syrup and stuff. And yeah, I mean, those maybe there's some nutritional issues all over the place, but I, I keep thinking it's the lifestyle. I mean, mm -hmm. what do we have to do now physically, uh, you know, and as you pointed out, you know, someone that finds that they're overweight because they're consuming too much of whatever it might be, you know, now they're spending money at a, a gym that they're driving to. Um, you know, it always strikes me how many cars there are at <laughs> yeah. the gym. It's like, um, it doesn't need to, to be that way. But we've, I think just over time, kind of almost been programmed to, to think this is how it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And this isn't really how it's supposed to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I was, uh, no, uh, doing, we, we heated with wood since, what, when was that uh, oil crisis in the mid-70s or something like that? Yep. And, <clears throat> you know, so I have to get out there every day and drag in the wood and split the Shit, kindling. Yeah. And uh, I did a video oh, several years ago, and I interviewed various people who burn wood. And almost to a person, they said, oh, I don't have to go to the gym. You know, I get my exactly. exercise. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of a scrawny guy, but I'm actually much more strapping than I used to be bec since we started heating with wood, um, <laughs> which is nice occasionally for trying to accomplish other things that I just couldn't do before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you got the, if you split your wood in, in the late fall or whatever, that's a real nice time because it warms you up. Like they say, it warms you three times and then you're <laughs> carrying it in and then heating it too. But, Mm -hmm. You know, that said about wood, I sure wouldn't want a lot of the people in this community to start eating <laughs> with wood the way I do, because I think um, there are much more efficient ways to eat with wood. There's a technology called rocket mass stoves, and hmm. uh, that's a way very clean burning, m perhaps as much as four to eight times less wood needed than a conventional wood stove, because hmm. they use the principles of thermal mass and extracting heat that would otherwise be going out your flue. They have real clean burns. So if, if we in the future have to have a lot more people once again heating with wood because of our population now mm -hmm. and even our expectations on what temperatures you, you know, need in your home, um, we'll probably have to, you know, ensure that that can happen and look at the zoning, for example, and, and uh, you know, have some sort of discussions about and probably examples and demonstrations of like that technology, for example, and mm -hmm. and um, you know people during World War II would run vehicles on wood as well with wood gasification. I wow. sure wouldn't want to see all the vehicles that we have now out there running on wood. I mean, <laughs> you know, the forest wouldn't last too long. But however, lightweight, uh, maybe aerodynamic sub thousand pound vehicles that are much more efficient used on a limited basis and in combination with bicycles, we might be able to do something like that much mm -hmm. more realistically using wood power. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this uh, very efficient wood burning system? The rocket mass heaters? Right, or, right. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a guy who, uh, there's a book out there you can get, there's lots of videos on YouTube, um, there's some DVDs actually that they're putting together now. Um, it, it's essentially just a, a very simple combustion unit, they call it a J-tube, and uh, you feed your wood in on a, on a uh, feed zone, and it goes in and it burns in a very insulated ch mini chimney section, hmm. which it's so hot in there that it uh, incinerates everything, and you just basically get, instead of getting tar and smoke coming out, you'll get just CO2 and water vapor. Um, that then goes through a heated bench or a heated bed, or some, you know, structure that's built kind of where your fireplace may have been, you'll have a heated bench that will be warm the next morning. So you can go and hmm. eat your breakfast or check some email or whatever on a heated bench. And I haven't built one in my house yet, but um, mm -hmm. I'm getting some plans. I've got a book that I've read and I'm probably gonna start with one, you know, maybe to supplement heat in a, in a mini little greenhouse I put together. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, once I get the bugs worked out, I'd like to put it in the house. Now where I live, mm -hmm. that's allowed in Pano, zoning wise, but I'm not sure like in Bennington or in North Bennington, mm -hmm. could people just go and pop one of those in their houses? I'd be surprised if right at the moment, but you know, if you can train contractors or something, or people get a little certification, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think there's no reason why you couldn't do that just as much as you could have a wood stove and they're far cleaner than the outdoor wood burning furnaces, which, you know, I've heard just one of those can stink up a whole valley. I mean, I've seen, you know, <laughs> examples of that. So those things can be really inefficient in a way. Hmm. But that that kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, talking to your students about entrepreneurial opportunities. You know, here's a technology mm. that is waiting for an application. It's waiting for someone to figure out a simple, straightforward way to make that amenable to the houses that we live in today. If you figure out how to do that, you're going to have all the work <laughs> that you can handle. And it, those are the kinds of things, you know, when I, when I talk about showing my students the pictures of Bennington 100 years ago, it's not nostalgia for the past that I'm trying to create here. We, mm. we're, we know more than we did then. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to abandon the technologies and the information that we've gained over whether it's new technologies for how we burn 
uh, wood or what it may be, it, we need to use the information and this massive information library that we've created through the internet to find a way to do what we need to do that's appropriate for today. And mm -hmm. I think that, uh, that we're, we've learned a lot of lessons. There's lots of opportunities. It, in some ways, it's, it's very easy to be pessimistic or depressed about what's going on uh, with the inevitability of these changes that we're going to have to deal with. But with every challenge comes an opportunity. And uh, I, I hope we'll rise to them. Mm. Yes, I certainly think that's the case. Can anybody read that clock over there? Where are we on time there? Yeah, well, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> there, there's another thing that I wanted to go back to for a, sec to, a second to when uh, Scott talked about, you know, the way we've built things, we've isolated ourselves into segmented communities. Uh, other things happen when you do that. For example, when you build a shopping center, instead of putting buildings close together, which might make it more amenable for mm -hmm. foot or bicycle transportation, it has to be separated by parking spaces. Nationwide, 90% of the parking spaces in the country are always empty <laughs> because we've built 10 times as many parking spaces as mm. we have automobiles. Wow. Just so there'll always be a place to park when you get to where you want to go. Ah. So we have all this terrain <laughs> covered with asphalt right. that oh might gosh. have been more effectively used for uh, uh, multi-use communities or uh, wow. might have been compacted and saved some of our surrounding working landscape. So uh -huh. things like transportation get tied to things like zoning laws, mm -hmm. and they get tied to uh, uh, last mile internet delivery. Does the person who lives on the top of the mountain pay the same for their internet no. service that the person who lives at Four Corners <laughs> pay? It, it has distorted the way we think about property and property taxes particularly. Uh, we don't acknowledge how much of the share of our property taxes come from the cost of the infrastructure that's required to support a spread out uh -huh. uh, population. Mm -hmm. Every time you add a subdivision on the edge of town, you have more streets that have to be plowed, more sewer system that has to be built, more cars for the police force because they can't walk anymore to uh -huh. the, client that the uh, clients that they have to serve, more fire departments and more fire trucks to d cover more area. Mm -hmm. All of that goes into our property taxes. And the way mm -hmm. we have built has been sort of an insidious burden on, on our tax base. That one of the excesses, one of the costs of the way we live today is in the taxes that we have to pay to support a, a much more complex infrastructure than we once had. Mm. So it's something to keep in mind when you when you are concerned about your property taxes or you're worried mm -hmm. about them you know they seem to go up inevitably year after year it's good to look at how the way we're building the community and how the way we're living is imposing certain kinds of taxes on us mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah i know um what's that guy's name from saratoga springs um who Cutsler. Yeah, Kunstler, Jim William Hart, Howard Kunstler <coughs> was encouraging people to live more in the uh, urban compact rather than spreading out. And I often wonder, <coughs> as I'm driving up this endless road to my son's house up there in northern Vermont, wow, just think of uh, the expense, you know, as you say, you could maintain these roads, plow them, run a school bus back there, all the emergency vehicles, and, you know, so should I get down on my son and say, move to the city. <laughs> move to town. <laughs> it's an uh, interesting thing. You talked about uh, telecommuting, having a student in Albany and so on. And I'm not so sure that telecommuting is such a, a wonderful thing for us because, in a way, it, it enables us to be further That's removed. Right you know, the internet and cell phones and all this sort of stuff. Mm. You know, all our, our links now are relying on incredibly complex systems, you know, <sighs> the computer networks, the, electronic, uh, the, the electric grid and so on that we have, you know, some of the most complex systems, built systems that we have. And, you know, if you live up on some 
<laughs> distant road in Vermont, I mean, you're probably taking advantage of, of those things. And if those didn't exist, maybe you'd be living downtown. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, it's just a yeah. thought. I mean, it might not work that way for some folks, but yeah. there's a lot of conflicts like this. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. a lot of people that are concerned about the, the carbon dioxide levels going up year after year and, you know, what that means for our future. You know, one of the things they'll harp on is, you know, efficiency in our vehicles and in our homes and so on. Mm -hmm. But there's really no reason to think that that's going to work particularly well, the, the pursuit of efficiency, because everyone looks at these things, not, well, not everyone, but a lot of people look at these things in terms of monetary cost. Mm -hmm. If you have a car that can get 50 miles to the gallon instead of 15 miles to the mm -hmm. gallon, um, that allows you to maybe live a little bit further away and rely on all these more yeah. complex systems. But it also, and there's only so much really good cheap oil in the world. And that's not there these days as everyone knows. So what happens is, is the price goes up to like 90 or $100 a barrel. Now you can start looking at things that before you couldn't consider doing like tar sands. Maybe, you know, at $80 a barrel, they can actually justify the complexity that it takes to do that sort of stuff. Or fracturing the ground to pull out oil in North Dakota and stuff. You can't do that unless oil costs at least 40 or $50 a barrel. So every time someone has a more efficient home that relies on oil or a car or whatever it is, you know, you're, you're now kind of opening up another can of worms elsewhere on the uh -huh. supply side for these things. Mm -hmm. It's only if you can get to where you're using something else, but as long as you're making those things effectively less for the utility you're gaining, they're going to be developed probably. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you could argue that uh, having a car that only gets five miles to the gallon, you're probably going to live closer to town. You might not use that car nearly as much. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it could be a, a bomb of a car, but, uh, you know, if gasoline costs uh, four dollars a gallon is, uh, you know, not quite there at the moment, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to use that car probably too much. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I, I sort of wonder, you know, in this whole thing, you see these crowds here in this uh, trailer to do the math by Bill McKibben, the, this activism to try to get legislation or try to influence the big oil companies, and, uh, you know, how much of that do we have to actually do? You know, am I <coughs> misplacing my efforts by going up to the garden watering the onions? when maybe I should be spending more time, you know, doing things on the internet or going to Washington, D.C. and pounding on some legislator's door to try to dissuade them from supporting the big oil companies. You know, uh, it, it's kind of a quandary about where can I most responsibly spend oh. my time to you know, try to meet this challenge. It, I'm going to throw out there, I, while it might not feel like you're making a, a statement so much, but I would say, you know, Raising the onions at home is much more meaningful because at least then when you're done, you got something to eat. <laughs> you know? yeah, right. um, I'm not so sure that banging on politicians is really going to matter much. And you know, you keep coming back to the problem. If you if you have coal and natural gas and oil and you know all these things that everyone doesn't want to use because of the carbon dioxide, you know, what's going to keep someone from from using that? I mean, until someone buys up the oil fields and says, you know, we're gonna, we're, <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> Sierra Club buys it, saying says, says, <laughs> we're not going to do anything with it. But you know, nobody can possibly afford that. And the utility that that brings, especially as efficiency goes up, is just tremendous. Um, I, I find it, I struggle that there's policies that can be enacted that will be accepted by the masses when they realize what those policies mean that will curtail the, the use of those fuels. I, I, you know, a lot of people out there are probably cringing and <laughs> yeah, throwing right. tomatoes at their screen right now if, if they care about carbon dioxide. But uh, I think growing the onions is definitely better for mm -hmm. you and those around you. Than it certainly seemed to have more sway with my students, the things I've done myself, as opposed uh -huh. to the things I would tell them they should do. Oh, yeah. So, uh -huh. you know, being the change that I was interested in and in trying to get my own uh, addictions to excessive energy under control, that always seemed like they were more interested in how I did that uh -huh. and, uh, and, and interested in participating in doing that. Um, I had a class that was uh, sponsored by the Department of Labor that was for at-risk youth 
and two of the guys in there who had otherwise, you know, had kind of a hard time with some of their instructors, they put, when, when given something that they saw the value in, we, we built a solar hot air box for a guy who was um, disabled and trying to heat with wood. Oh. They, were, they were, you know, putting it done and get it done. And uh, they, they loved that. They helped me also with a motorized bicycle. And, you know, I could see their eyes light up when they were seeing direct oh. results. Yeah. And, uh, and with some other students, we um, grew food in the greenhouse attached to the high school right into December. We used, uh, you know, mm. just methods that have been in use in Maine, for example, and, and longer in France where people would, uh, you know, trap heat with glass and plastic and extend the season. So, mm. you know, when they had those hands-on opportunities, it, they were really shining. And whereas in other cases, maybe, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have a connection. And I look forward to in the future, as more challenges become apparent, I think um, just like you know, a big snowstorm I lived through in Washington D.C., where neighbors came together, people who otherwise you know let their differences sort of push them apart. Mm -hmm. Those challenges brought us together. I kind of look forward to that in the future. People who might be different, you know, I'm sure I talk a lot more than some of the parents of my students, and you know, they just quietly take care of business. But in the future, probably people like me who are obsessed with information and people who are really good at getting things done will all work together and you know deal with some of these challenges that really will uh, probably show us you know our true metal mm -hmm. well i I'd, I'd like to go back to the example of the bike path mm -hmm. yeah this town has been trying for 30 years to get a bike path put between mm -hmm. bennington and north bennington mm -hmm. we've been up and down the legislature we've had federal earmarks we've had state money we've written grants, we've gotten petitions, we've gotten road blocked in one way or another every time. What finally happened to make this path happen is about a half a dozen people said, let's just do it. Yep. <laughs> That's why it's called the Ninja Bike Path, because we weren't <laughs> asking anybody. The only people that we asked, and the key to our success, was the landowners themselves. Uh -huh. Once we had the right of way, we had everything. It's much less difficult to get a dozen people in a backhoe out to work on a weekend for eight hours mm -hmm. than it is to get federal money to build a bike path. And I think that's the lesson I took from mm -hmm. the Ninja Bike Path. That's yeah. one of the things that concerns me with a lot of things that need to happen or will have to happen is are there laws and rules and uh, generally accepted customs that are going to be getting in the way? And, uh, you know, those people need to be ready to dismantle and throw those things out that are getting in the way of what needs to happen as mm -hmm. we go forward. You know, food safety, you know, yeah. that's, a, that's a big thing, you know. You want to have uh, your own cow for milk and you want to sell it to your neighbor or exchange it with your neighbor, something like that, you know. Yeah. Depending on where you are, it mm -hmm. might not be able to happen. Yeah. Well, what a great summation of a marvelous conversation here. Thank you very much, Jesse, Ruth. Sure. Yeah, Scott. Scott, and um, we hope that more of us can act locally. <laughs>